Hey folks, welcome back. Uh, so coming up real soon, you have test number two in CSE 1300. And so this video is going to help you study for that test and tell you what to expect on the test. So first off, we're going to talk about what the test does include and what it doesn't include. So the sections that were in this test are computational thinking, introduction to Java, data types, operands, and expressions. All right, so those were the three sections. We are not including conditionals, which we have already covered in lecture, but they'll be on the next test, so they're not on this test. All right, so computational thinking, introduction to Java, data types, operands, and expressions. And those are the names of the modules in D2L. So if you go into your D2L shell and you look under content, you'll see the names of those modules in there. And that's where the PowerPoint presentations are, as well as the video lectures, um, if you need to go back and review something. All right, so test number two is going to work as follows. You're going to have a 24 hour window during which you will take the exam. Um, so we will give you from one minute after midnight until 11.59 on one day. And during that 24 hour window, you can start the test at any time that you want. Whether you're in an in-person section or an online section, it doesn't matter. You're allowed to take it any time within there. Um, however, we would strongly recommend that you do not leave it until the very end of that window. And I'll explain why again in just a second. All right, so once you start your test, you're going to have 60 minutes to answer the questions. There are about 20 questions, so you have about three minutes per question as you're working through it. The questions are not going to take you three minutes, but you have about three minutes per question. Um, you must have all 60 minutes available. And so what I mean by that is make sure that you have taken care of anything that you might need to do. Put your phone on silent and tell everybody to leave you alone. If you have some pets, I love pets, but they probably don't want to be in the room with you while you're taking the test. And I guess roommates are kind of like pets. Best if they're not there either. But in general, find a place where it's quiet, where you have a dedicated 60 minutes that nobody is going to interrupt you, and you can just focus on the test. All right, the way you're going to take the test is it's administered in D2L. So you're going to go into D2L, you're going to click on quizzes up at the top, and you're going to see exam two. And then you're going to click that. It's going to invoke the lockdown browser, just like in exam one. The camera is going to turn on, so you have to have a working webcam. And then it's going to do the setup where it asks you to show your ID and show the environment around you as it's um, recording. And then it will start the test. The test 60 minutes begins when you get to the start test button, not while you're doing all that setup. That's not part of the time. So make sure that you are within the window, the 24 hour window, by the time that you're hitting that start test button. And what I mean by that is, if you leave it till 11.55 and then you start the process of taking the test, it may take you more than five minutes to get logged into D2L and to get the test opened and to go through the setup in Lockdown Browser. And if that were to happen and it's 12.01 when you go to press the Start Test button inside of Lockdown Browser, it's going to tell you the test has already expired. So don't leave it till the last minute. Make sure you start early in the day and give yourself time to deal with any problems that happen. All right. So to take the test, you're going to need a quiet place where you're not interrupted for 60 minutes. I've said that. A reliable computer with a webcam. Look, I've had people come to me after the test and say, I was having problems with my laptop and it had been acting weird all day. Well, if it's been acting weird all day, go and find another computer. You can use one of the ones in the lab. You can use one in the library. You can probably use your roommates. You can go borrow some friends. Just make sure you have a reliable working computer by the time you take the test. The computer needs to be either Windows or Mac. It technically can be done on a Chromebook, but I highly recommend you don't try that because, again, it's still beta software. So, mm. all right, you need a reliable web, uh, reliable Wi-Fi connection um, or connectivity. Um, if you have the option, plug your computer into an actual Ethernet port. Um, if you don't have that option, then that's fine. Just make sure you're somewhere where the Wi-Fi works reliably. If your home Wi-Fi is acting weird that day or you're having problems with it, or even if your dorm is acting weird, then go to the library or if you are off campus, go to a, a coffee shop or a McDonald's or something like that where they have reliable Wi-Fi. Um, make sure your computer has enough power to take the test. I always have people who run out of power in the middle of the test, and it's because they didn't plug in their laptop or whatever. So make sure you have reliable power, reliable Wi-Fi in a quiet place where you can do your work. Um, the room that you're taking the test in has to be brightly lit. We have to be able to see your face. As a matter of fact, it probably won't let you start the test unless it can reliably detect your face. So it needs to be brightly lit and the camera needs to be facing straight onto your face. 
in such a way that we can see your whole face, um, just like I'm doing here in this little window. All right, your ID card, you have to have that with you. If you have your Talon card, that's the correct answer. If you don't have your Talon card, a driver's license works, um, but it has to be an official ID card. That's the only thing you should have with you other than your computer or laptop or whatever it is that you're using to take the test. Before you start the exam, close all the applications on your computer. So if you've got a whole bunch of stuff running, if you've got a game in the background or something that changes your wallpaper or something else that's running on the computer, turn all of that off because sometimes that will interact with lockdown browser and cause your machine to lock up. So it's just best to get everything shut down, all your Chrome browsers or Safari windows, get them all closed and then start the test just with one window. All right, so the format of the test, there are about 20 questions. Um, they're worth five points each if there's 20, so they're evenly distributed. Um, the questions are pretty much all multiple choice with true or false or matching. Um, you will not have to write any Java code on the test. Um, however, you will be expected to read and understand Java code or fill in the blank Java code. So we might give you a block of text and say, which of the following lines would do something in that block of text? In which case you'd just be choosing between multiple choices, but you're effectively needing to understand the code in order to answer that correctly. All right, the test is auto graded. So as soon as you're done with the test, it will show you your score. It will not allow you to see which questions you got right and wrong. And that's because we will have people taking the test in different sections at different times. And even though the tests are randomized, we don't allow people to uh, see their answers until everybody has had a chance to take the test across all the sections. So usually that's about a week after the test. Um, the test is out of 100 points and those 100 points account for 10% of your overall grade. So it is important, you gotta make sure you do well on this. All right, there are no makeups for the test. You have a 24 hour window during which you can take the test. So you need to plan ahead. Um, this is a part of being in college. We're not gonna hold your hands here. Uh, you have to figure out how to make it work for you. So you have a 24 hour window. If you've got something else you have to do that day, or if you gotta work or you gotta get up early or you gotta go to bed early or whatever else, that's cool. That's why we gave you a 24 hour window. Find a time when you can take it that you can dedicate one hour to it and make sure that you have that time. If you miss this test, if you for whatever reason forget and it's 12.02 and you're trying to take the test and it won't let you in, the answer is tough. There are no makeups for the test. Again, you've had 24 hours, you've had plenty of notice. The date that this test was on has been posted since the beginning of the semester. Now, if you have some situation where you can't take the test on that day, and you can provide me specific documentation. There's only a small handful of circumstances under which we'll work with you, but they have to be pretty extreme circumstances. But if you have a reason why you can't do it, and the typical ones are you actually have military papers where you're getting deployed somewhere or you're being brought to active duty for some reason, or you're specifically getting um, a circumstance where you're gonna be in hospital all that day and you have doctor's notes that can prove that, um, or you have um, a KSU obligations such as a sports team or something else where there's a documented reason that you are not available during that entire 24-hour period, then we will work with you to reschedule the test for pretty much all other reasons you need to take it during that 24-hour time. So if you have a problem, let us know up front and we'll talk to you and, and try and work it out with you. But overall, you need to find a way to make it work during that day. All right, so last comment on the test taking. Uh, ideals um, if you have a problem during the test this happens we're not there with you so if there's an issue during the test then pretty much what you're going to need to do is you're going to need to try and troubleshoot it yourself so if you have something where I've had somebody who their mouse stopped working in the middle of the test well they were still able to answer the questions by using the tab button on their keyboard to get up and down between the questions so you know if something like that works that happens then just try to make it work for the remainder of the test Sometimes you have a touch screen so you can actually answer the questions using the touch screen. So just think through it, try to problem solve. That's kind of what we're doing here in this class. If you cannot figure out what's going on and your computer is just being weird or it's suddenly locked up, go ahead and reboot your computer. However, if you are outside of the test window now, then the computer will not let you back into the test. If you are still within the 24 hour window, then it will let you back into the test. And this is another reason to not start it at the very end. So if you run into a problem and you can't figure out and you can't proceed, go ahead and reboot your computer. Now, I will tell you that one of the rules is you are not allowed to leave the test once you start it. And so you might say, well, then I'm just gonna reboot my computer and then I can get up and leave for 10 minutes. The clock is still running 
And when you come back from um, rebooting the computer, you need to tell us on the video, because it's recording you the whole time you can talk to us, you need to tell us what it is that just happened. And as long as that's a reasonable circumstance, we'll work with you. But if it is any reason other than something completely locked up on your computer, then you get a zero on the test. So again, don't do this lightly, but if you get to the point where it's not working, go ahead and reboot the computer and try to come back into the test. If that does not work and you still cannot take the test, then in the instructions at the beginning of the test, there is the following phone numbers that are listed here on this slide, and they are the KSU help desk, which is staffed until 11 p.m., and there's also the University System of Georgia's help desk, which is staffed 24 hours a day. You need to call one of those, and you need to get a ticket from them, and then within 15 minutes of having a problem on the test, you need to email your instructor and let them know what happened during the test and provide the ticket number. All right, and those are the extreme circumstances of something bad happening. All right, so those are the rules. No matter what, you need to tell us what happened very quickly after the test is over. You cannot wait a day or two and then come back to us and say, oh, well, I was having computer problems. There's nothing we can do. You have to notify us immediately when it happens. All right, so those are all of the rules of the test taking. Um, you're going to do fine. Don't panic. I know there's a lot of rules there and it all sounds scary, but it's really not that bad. It works the exact same way as test one did. I just have to go over the rules. All right, so let's talk about the material that's on the test. Um, so the first section was the um, computational thinking. And this section had one slide deck that was called Intro to Java, and it had another slide deck that was called Computational Thinking or um, Thinking Like a Programmer. All right, so in those decks, we had the following topics that we talked about, and I'm just going to move this window to the other side. OK, there we go. That's a little better. All right, so each of these topics are things you should understand. The word abstraction. This is taking a big problem, breaking it down into smaller problems, and not worrying about all the details of how you're going to solve the smaller problems. Group together all the things that you know how to do and solve them, and then put them together until you can solve the bigger problem. So it's not worrying about the whole thing at once, but breaking it down into smaller chunks that are more manageable, solve the smaller chunks, and then work your way up to the bigger things. That's the idea of abstraction. We talked about algorithms. An algorithm is just a set of steps that you need to complete in order to accomplish a task. So it's, it's going to be a set of steps which have to be clear. They have to be very easy to follow for a computer, which of course means that they have to be very precise. They have to be unambiguous. So, you know, fill the cup half. Well, do you mean literally half or do you mean a little more? It has to be exact, very precise. Um, they should be concise. They should explain how to do it as simply as possible. You don't want a big, long, complex set of steps if there's an easier way to do it. So algorithms are sets of steps that solve a problem. They sometimes have input, they sometimes have output, and they are how you organize the thoughts of what it is that you're going to do with a computer program later on. All right, sometimes you'd like to picture things as a flowchart, and we've seen examples of these in class over the last couple of weeks, but flowcharts basically have little diamond boxes, which are decision points. And when you have an arrow coming into the decision point, it'll have a yes and a no option that come out of it that'll lead you to other decision points or other places in the flowchart. Flowcharts are a great way to visualize a complex problem. And so they can allow you to think through it kind of on a whiteboard where you can just draw it out and see what it is that you want to do. And so um, flowcharts are can also then be converted into computer code. So effectively, an algorithm is a written out version of code, and a flowchart is a drawn version of the code, and then both of those can be converted into computer code in a particular language. We've talked about pseudocode in this class. Pseudocode is the high-level language where the syntax doesn't matter. We've mostly done examples in Java in the class, but if we want to, we can draw an algorithm out on a board using pseudocode so that we can discuss it without getting bogged down in the details of a particular language or the syntax of the language. And so a good example of this is pseudocode doesn't care about semicolons at the end of lines, but Java does. Um, pseudocode doesn't care about the exact wording of each individual things, like print is just print, whereas in Java, we know it's system.out.println. So it's just more concise and easier to write things in in pseudocode. Allows people to discuss an algorithm without getting bogged down and it's useful to write your code, write your algorithm first using either just plain English or using a flowchart, and then convert it to pseudocode and then convert it into a language is a very reasonable way of solving a problem. 
it allows you to focus on the logic problems rather than the syntax problems. All right, so let's talk about logic problems and syntax problems. So a syntax error occurs when you write some code in Java, let's say, and you hit the compile button or that run button up at the top. The first thing that it does is it tries to compile your code and it's checking to make sure is your code actually syntactically correct. And so exa for example, as, as I mentioned a moment ago, every line of code in Java pretty much has to end in a semicolon. And so the compiler checks, did every line end in a semicolon? And there's certain keywords like int and float and double and car and system.out.println. And later on, we saw if and scanners and all these things. They have specific formats that they each have to be written in, and the compiler knows what that format should be. And it's going to check that and make sure that everything you wrote is correct. If you have a syntax error, when you hit run, it will not run, and the compiler will tell you that there's a syntax error, and it will tell you what specific error you have, mostly. If you have a logical error, on the other hand, when you hit run, the code will run. It's just it's going to produce for you a wrong answer. And so here we have an example where we have A is 7 and B is 3 and C is 10. And we're trying to find the sum of those three numbers. So we say int ABC equals A plus C, which is not right. That's not what I meant. I meant A plus B plus C. And so then when I print out A plus B plus C equals, I'm going to get the wrong answer. I'm specifically going to get 17 and I should get 20. So this is not an example of a syntax error. All of the code that's written on the screen here is actually syntactically correct. And what I mean by that is all of these are correct. There's nothing about that that's not allowed in Java. And even this is correct from a syntax standpoint, but it's not correct from a logic standpoint because there should be A plus B plus C. So a logical error is not something you're going to see from the compiler. It's something you're going to see later when you try to run your code. All right, so then we had the section where we were talking about thinking like a programmer, and we had a couple of terms in there. We talked about hardware, and this physical computer that you're sitting on front of is an example of hardware. Your phone is an example of hardware, and any device that has a computer inside of it is a piece of hardware. And so your car is a piece of hardware, um, your phone, your tablet, even things like projectors in the rooms and televisions and all that kind of stuff, they're all hardware. Software, on the other hand, or programs, are the code that somebody wrote. So there's a developer somewhere who sat down, came up with an algorithm, converted it into code, compiled the code, and shipped it to you as a piece of software. And so every game you've run, every app that you've run on your phone, every application that you've run on your desktop computer, Microsoft Word, um, Google Docs, uh, whatever the latest game is that you've been playing on your phone, all of those are examples of software or programs. All right, the word programming means taking some idea, converting it into an algorithm, and then writing the algorithm in a programming language with the correct syntax. So it's the art of converting an idea, an, uh, an algorithm, into a program in a specific language. All right, an IDE was something we mentioned that that's an integrated development environment. And this is a piece of software, ironically, that is used for you to write new pieces of software. And so it has an editor that allows you to type in your new code. And it also checks the code as it's running to make sure, as you're typing it, to make sure that what you're typing is valid. It gives you hints as to what new things you might want to put in there. Um, so if you start typing system.out, it'll say, do you mean system.out.print line or system.out.print? Um, so it'll suggest new things that you might want to use. Then we have the idea of the compiler. So the compiler is the piece of software that takes your source code, what you wrote in Java, and converts it into machine code so that it can actually run on the machine. Um, the compiler does two jobs. One is it checks your syntax for syntax errors, tells you what they are, and then once it's happy that there are no syntax errors, it compiles the code into machine code that can be run on your machine. All right. And then the last one on here on these terms is skeleton code. And we mentioned that in pretty much all programming languages, there's some very basic code that always has to be there. And so every time you open up your IDE, whether that be IntelliJ or Replit, what you've, sat, what you've found in there is at the top, it usually says something like class program, uh, public static void main, and then in parentheses, it'll have string, square brackets, argv, close parentheses. It'll open a curly brace. It probably has a comment or a hello world print statement, and then two closing curly braces. 
all of that is the skeleton. It has to be there for every program, and you write your code inside of that main method. In the main method is the main is the method that is run when the code is executed. All right. So that brings us to the different types of Java statements that we've seen. So we've talked about import statements. You've seen them twice so far. One way is when we were doing read statements. Anytime that you're reading information in from the user in Java, you're going to need to import Java Util Scanner. And th what that's going to do is it allows the computer to access a library of code called Scanner, which has the ability to um, read information in from the user. All right, the second thing that we've talked about are semicolons. Um, every line of Java pretty much has to end with a semicolon. And what that does is it basically tells the compiler, I'm done with this statement and I'm moving on to the next statement. We've seen that the main method and also the class definition, which we haven't really talked about the class definition, but at the top of your code, it says class program or something like that. Each of those have curly braces and the curly braces surround the code that you write. So in the main method, it says public static void main, and then it has parentheses, again, string um, square brackets, ARGV, close parentheses. Then there's a curly brace that opens, and later there's one that closes. Those two curly braces denote the beginning and the end of your main program, which is where you're writing all of your code. And they're very important. Every time you open a curly brace, you must also close a curly brace. All right, next up, we'll talk about comments. Comment is a way to put information into your code that isn't used or read by the compiler. The compiler ignores all of the comments in the code. It's basically just there to allow you as the developer or another developer that may come along behind you and maintain your code to look at the code and understand what it is that you're doing. So a comment is achieved in Java either by putting two slashes at the beginning of a line um, so it's um, slash slash. And then the other way that you can do it is you can do slash star and then have multiple lines and then star slash on the last line. So those are the two ways of doing comments. System.out.print and system.out.println are the way that the computer sends information out to the user. So if you want to put something on the user's screen, you're going to use a system.out.print or you're going to use a system.out.println. The difference between the two is that system.out.print does not put a carriage return at the end of the line. And what I mean by that is after it prints the line like this, if this were the line, a system.out.print will just stop here. But if I do a system.out.print line of this line at the end of it, it will move down to here at the beginning of the next line. So that's the difference between those two. They both do the same job. It's just a matter of whether you get the thing that moves you to the beginning of the next line or not. All right, and the last thing in here was strings, which they are one of the types, and we used those with print lines a lot because often you want to print out a string like hello world, which is a literal string when you're just putting hello world inside of double quotes, but sometimes you can also define a variable that is a string, set a value on it, and then print out that variable. All right, so that brings us to the topic of variables. So you definitely need to be familiar with all of these. Uh, you should know the difference between the different kinds of numbers the different kinds of um, characters, booleans, and strings. So let's talk about the numbers first. That's this category up here. There, in Java, there are six different types of numbers. We have numbers that can store um, whole numbers only, and those begin at byte, which can do negative 127 to positive 127, short, which does 32,764 plus and minus, int, which does 2.14 billion plus and minus, and long, which does 9 quintillion plus and minus. All right, so if you're storing the number 7, you could store it in any of those. But if you're going to store the number 3,450, then you can't store that in a byte. It has to at least be a short. And if you're going to store 500,000, then that's going to have to be in an int. In general, ints are the ones that you use the most often. But if you're storing a very big number that's bigger than 2 billion, then you'll need to use a long. All right, so the first four are the whole numbers. The last two are for floating point numbers. A floating point number has a decimal point in it. So if you're trying to store pi 3.14, you would probably store that in a float. If you want more precision, you store it in a double. The float stores seven places after the decimal point, whereas the double stores 16 places after the decimal point. So just depends on which one you need at a given moment. 
All right, so that brings us to storing a character. So if you're trying to store a character in a string, or sorry, in a variable, then you're going to use the car type, C-H-A-R. And the car type can store one single um, character. And so an example of a character is A, and anytime that you have a character, there has to be a single quote around the character. You cannot use double quotes. It can only be single quotes. Um, so then next up we have Boolean. And what Boolean does is it stores multi, uh, either true or false. And with regard to um, Booleans, the thing to be careful about there is that um, you can only store true or false. They don't have double quotes around them. They don't have single quotes around them. They literally just have true or false. Um, all right. So then that brings us to um, strings. So a string is a bunch of letters that are stored together. A character can only store one letter, but a string can store a whole bunch of letters. And the way that a string works is that it's going to have double quotes around it instead of single quotes. And those double quotes begin at the beginning of the string and end obviously at the end of the string. And you can have as much text in there as you need to have. The first eight of these types are all considered primitive types. So the ones that I'm outlining here, Boolean, character, double, float, long, int, short, and byte are the primitive data types. That's an important word to remember. Um, the string is the only example that you've seen so far of a complex data type. All right, so booleans, cars, doubles, floats, longs, ints, shorts, and bytes, all primitive, string, complex. That's what you need to remember there. All right, so then let's talk about the rules for making variables. So in Java, if you want to make a variable, you specify its type, and then you specify the name of the variable that you want to create. And so, for example, if we were declaring a variable called x, we would say int x semicolon. And what that does is it makes for me a variable. That variable is called x. It has the name x, and it can store one integer in it at any given moment. Um, if you want to then later assign a number to x, you would just simply say x is equal to 7. A single equals like this is an assignment. You're taking a value and you're storing it in a variable. So x equals 7. Later on in the code, you might say x equals 14. Or you could say something like x equals 3 plus 2 um, when we get to the arithmetic operators. All right, the variables should be named well. So in general, the name of the variable probably shouldn't be x. It should be something that indicates what's being used, what the variable is being used for. And so if we have a variable that's going to hold a person's name, it should be called name. If you're going to have a variable that's going to hold an age, it probably should be called age, and so on and so forth. There are a couple of different ways in which you can name your variables. I'm noticing that there's an extra word here. I'm just removing it, sorry. Um, if you're naming your variable a name that has multiple words in it, you are not allowed to put spaces in there. Um, all variable names must be a single word. And so if you have more than one word, then you can either use camel case, which is what's happening in this first example. Uh, camel case, the first letter of the first word is lowercase, but the first letter of every other word is going to be in capital letters. And camel case allows you to um, string multiple words together. So this is my variable with a lowercase t and then a capital I, a capital I, a M, and a capital V for variable. The other alternative in the other commonly way, done way is to use multiple words with an underscore in between them um, to separate them out. You can also create constants. A variable can change, a constant cannot. The names are pretty simple. Constants are always named with all capital letters, and so that's just a convention to make it easier to see that it's a constant. Typically, constants um, hold a value that you have no desire to ever change. And so, for example, you might say constant pi is equal to um, 3.14. Actually, sorry, the word is final. Um, final float pi equals 3.14 is how you would actually do that. So the word final is used to indicate that a very that a um, a uh, constant is being created. All right. So the reason that we use constants is because sometimes there are things that you want to be always true in your code, 
but you want to allow it so that if later they did change, you would be able to update that line of code. And so an example of this might be, let's imagine you're an elevator operator and you, you make elevators. Well, there's probably a maximum weight that your elevator can handle. Let's say it's 2000 pounds. So you would have a constant at the top of your code that says max weight equals 2000. And then that would be true for all of your code. And at any point, if you need to check to make sure you're not overweight, then you just check against the constant to see if you're less than the constant. But then in five years, they may come up with a way to make the elevator more robust and be able to hold slightly more weight. And so at some point, they might update it to 3,000 pounds or 5,000 pounds or whatever it turns out to be. And in those cases, they just have to update it in one place in the code. And then all of the references later on in the code would automatically be updated. So that's why we use constants. All right, so that brings us to printing. Uh, when we print something out on the screen, as I mentioned, we have system.out.println or system.out.print. Inside of either of those parentheses at the end, you can have a string. And so we could have a string literal. Um, and the, in the case of a string literal, we have something like, um, okay, sorry. I don't know why I'm going backwards suddenly. There we go. Okay, so the example of a string literal is um, where you would have something like hello world. And that's in double quotes, and it's literally a string that I want to appear on the screen. That's where the word comes from. You can also put a variable inside of a set of parentheses of a print statement. And in this case, what's going to happen because there's no double quotes around it, um, it's going to assume that you are talking about a variable. So it's going to look to see what the value of x is. And so up above, you might have something like int x equals 7. And so what this is going to print out is 7. All right. If you need to concatenate more than one thing together, concatenate just means shoving things together. So if you wanted to print out something like your grade in the class is, and then you want to print out the value of a letter grade variable, you would have a string literal. And you notice that this has the double quotes here at the beginning and the end. And then you use a plus sign, and then you use a variable name. And you can do that as often as you want. Hi, that's a string literal then add in the variable name, so hi enda, double quotes as this is another string literal here, welcome back, period, today is, and then you're filling in another variable called date. So this print statement has a string literal, a string literal, so two of those, and then it also has two variables, um, which are name and date, they're all being in there. So in the end, that would print out something like Hi, and a welcome back. Today is whatever the day's date is. All right. If you need to print something weird inside of a print statement, then there is a couple of cool little escape characters that you should be familiar with. We have slash n, which will give you a new line. So if you want hi, and to be on one line, and then welcome back. Today is on a separate line. You could say hi, and a slash n, and slash n would cause it to go to a new line. Likewise, a slash T moves your text over a little bit. That's a tab. If you're trying to print out literally a double quote, then you do that with a slash double quote. If you're trying to print out literally a single quote, you do it with a slash single quote. And if you're trying to literally print out a slash, you do it with two slashes. So the example of this um, printing out a literal double quote, you might have a system.out.print line, and then you might say something like E said or E says, hello. And so the issue here would be, you have to put a slash on front of that double quote and that double quote, because otherwise it thinks that the string began there and ended there. So that's why we have escape characters. All right, so that is all of the um, printing stuff. Next up, we talked about the need to be able to read information in from a user. All right, so reading in from a user is done with um, a scanner in Java. And so you need three lines of code in order to make it work. The first line of code is going to be an import statement that's going to be all the way at the top of your code. You're going to say import Java util scanner. And then inside of your main method, you're going to say scanner my scan equals new scanner system dot in. And again, that's something you pretty much just need to memorize. And then anytime you actually want to read something in, once you've done those two initialization steps, you're going to use a my scan 
which is the name of your variable that's coming from here, um, dot next line if you're wanting to read in a line. So in this example here, we're making a string called user input, and into that string, we are putting in the next line that the user types in on the screen. So when the program reaches this line of code, it's just going to pause, it's going to wait for the user to type in a line of text, whatever they type in, it's going to store it in user input. All right, and just like next line, we also have other ones. We have next int, we have next float, we have next boolean, we have next double, we have next shorts and bytes and all the other various different primitive types. Um, so next line is the most common one, next int is probably the next most common one. All right, so the next section was about arithmetic operators, and this is just doing basic math inside of Java. So um, these are pretty easy. We had all the ones that you would expect, like plus, minus, multiply, and divide. And the only gotchas with any of those are when you multiply two numbers, you might end up with a number that's bigger than an int. So make sure that you store it in something big enough to get your answer in. When you're dealing with slashes, it's going to do it as integers. So 10 slash 3 is going to return 3, not 3.333, because it's always going to try and do it as an integer. If you need it to be a float, then you would do 10 divided by 3f to make sure that it understands this is a float, and you're going to want to store that into a float. Float x equals 10 divided by 3f would give you back um, 3.333. All right, so those are the weird ones up there. The other weird one in this list is the percent sign, which is modulus, as uh, usually written as mod. And what that's doing is it's returning the remainder when you're doing division. And so the examples here are 10 mod 3. And that's because if you start off with 10, how many times does 3 go into it? Well, the answer is 3, but we don't really care about this. So that's an answer, but it's not that important. Take the 3 and multiply it back by the 3. So 3 times 3, that's going to be equal to 9. So how much is left over? Well, we started off with 10, and if we subtract that out, we are going to end up with 1. Not negative 1, I don't know why I did that. Um, all right, so effectively, the remainder is telling you after you've done the division, what's left over. So let's do the other one here. Uh, so we have 19 mod 5. Um, so the question here is 19 divided by 5, that's going to be 3, because 5 goes into 19 three times evenly. All right, so now we're going to multiply these two together. So 3 times 5 is equal to 15. And if we subtract that from the original 19, we're going to get a remainder of 4. So the mod of 19, 19 mod 5 is 4. All right, so you definitely need to know how to do modulus uh, math. Then the next thing that we talked about was the order of precedence. And so remember that multiply, divide, and mod have a higher precedence than add and subtract. Generally, everything is done left to right. But if you have pluses and multiplies in the same expression, the multiply happens first, even if it's not left to right, and then the plus happens next. And let me be clear that all of these have the same order of precedence, and all of these have the same order of precedence. And what I mean by that is, if you have a plus and a minus on the same line, they're just done left to right. Whichever order they were in, it doesn't matter, they're done left to right. If you have a slash, a multiply, and a mod on the same line, they're done just left to right. But if you have a multiply, and then a plus, and then a multiply, the two multiplies are done first, left to right, and then the plus is done later. All right? And then after that, we have the assignment operators and they happen after all of the arithmetic operators. As a matter of fact, the assignment operators will happen last in everything that we're going to talk about here. So an assignment operator is used when you're trying to assign a value to something else. And so we had something like x equals 3 plus 4. The way that works is it does the math first, and it gets 7, and then it stores that 7 in the x. We talked about the fact that there are some shortcut operators. So we could have an int x equals 7. And then we can say x plus plus. And what that's going to give you is 8. So a plus plus operator increments or adds 1 to the value of a previous variable. It's the same as saying x equals x plus 1. You take the original x and you add 1 to it. Since the x was 7, you add 1 to it. That gives you an 8. And then you do the assignment into x. So x becomes 8. All right, so just like plus plus, which adds 1, 
we also have minus minus, which subtracts one. We have plus equals, minus equals, multiply equals, and divide equals, as well as mod equals. Okay, so the way that those work is if we have 10, uh, sorry, int x equals 10, and I say something like x plus equals 5, then what's going to happen is that's the same as my saying x equals x plus 5, which means that x is now going to be 15 at the end of all of this. All right, so it's just a shortcut for x equals x plus. And in the case of plus plus, it's always going to be plus 1. But in the case of plus equals, it's going to be whatever number is on the right hand side. So it effectively adds 5 to your number. And if I did something like int y equals 15, and I do y slash equals 3, then y is now equal to 5. And the reason for that is because it's going to divide 15 by 3, and that of course gives me 5, and that's what y is going to be equal to. So this is the same as y equals y divided by 3. Okay, so that's what all of the arithmetic operators look like and all the shortcut operators look like for math. Okay, relational operators are the next thing that we looked at. And so if we're dealing with numbers and we're comparing numbers, we have the usual suspects of less than, greater than, less than or equal to, or greater than or equal to. And so you can certainly say, is 7 less than 10? And the answer to that is true. All of these are going to result in a Boolean. Um, so that's going to be true of all relational operators. They say yes or they say no at the end of it. And so if you're comparing two things that are numbers, you can do that. You can also compare characters. So A is indeed less than C. That is also true. Um, and obviously, you could come up with examples that are false. So we have less than, greater than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to. And then those are the ones where you're dealing with um, numbers. We also have the ability to deal with equal. Now, it's very important to recognize the difference between a single equals and two equals. In the case of a single equal, if we have something like int x equals 7, what I've done here is an assignment. I mean that I have taken the value 7 and I have put it into x. That's what a single equals does. But if I say x equal equals 7, this is a test that's going to result in a Boolean. So x equal to e equal equal to 7 is either going to be true or it's going to be false. They are very different things. A single equal does an assignment, a double equal does a test. So in relational operators, we only speak about equal equal, um, not single equal, because that's not a relational operator, that's an assignment. All right, so next up we have not equal, which will allow you to check something is not equal to something else. And as far as these are concerned, you can use them on integers, any form of a number, as well as characters and even Booleans. You can say true equals false with two equal signs in there. All right, so that brings us on to the last of the relational operators, which were when you're dealing with complex data types, it doesn't work the same because you can't compare is one name less than another name or greater than another name. That doesn't make any sense. So for strings, there's very specific methods that you use to compare strings. And so we have something like name equals enda or name equals ignore case enda, which allows you to check if two strings are the same. And so you would use that when you're dealing with strings. All right, so that's the relational operators. And then next up, we have the logical operators. Um, as far as logical operators are concerned, we have um, three of them. There is and, or, and not. We'll take them one at a time. An and operator in Java is done with two ampersands. An and operator will only return true if both of its operands are true. So if you say true and true, that gives you true. But if either side of that was a false, then the answer is false. You only get true if both sides are true with an and. All right, so that brings us to the or operator. The or operator returns true if either or both of the operands are true. So true or true is true. True or false, still true. False or true, still true. The only time you ever get false is if both of them were false. So false or false is false. And then the last one of these is the not operator. The not operator is used to reverse the current state of a Boolean. 
So if the Boolean is currently true, not will make it false. If the Boolean is currently false, not will make it true. So it just reverses it. So that leads us to, you should be able to evaluate a statement like this. So you need to remember the order of precedent with all of this and figure out how to do things. So the first thing that happens is math. And this looks like math, that looks like math, and um, that looks like math as well. All right, so the first one of those that's gonna happen is this one because it is inside of parentheses. So four minus two is going to be equal to two. That's the very first thing that gets evaluated because of the parentheses. After that, we have a multiply, a add, and a divide. So the multiply and the divide have the same order of precedence, so we're gonna do those left to right. So the next one that's gonna happen is six times three, and that's going to be 18. And then the next one is this 40 divided by two, divided by two is going to be 20, okay? And now finally, we're going to deal with the plus operator that we have here because that's the last bit of the math. So 18 plus two is equal to 20, obviously. All right, so just gonna clear that up. This first part of it um, that I'm underlining here, I'm actually just gonna erase all of the scribbles on the screen. Um, this first part here ended up being 20, and this second part here ended up being four minus two is two, 40 divided by two is 20. And so now it's checking whether the, we're now going to do the relational operators. So we have 20 greater than 20, and that's going to be false. All right, so I'm just gonna cross out everything that we've now evaluated. So all of that has been dealt with. All right, so that leaves us with false or, and then we have another comparison operator that's over here, and that would get done next, a relational operator, I mean. So C equal to D is false. So false or false is what we're left with. And now finally, now that all that has been done, we're gonna do the logical operator and false or false is still false because you have to have one side of it to be true in order to get a true result. So you should be able to take any arbitrary set of stuff like this and figure out what the final answer is and realize that that assignment onto the X would be the last thing that happens. X equals false is what this would eventually result in. So there's other examples in the original PowerPoint that deals with logical operators. If you need to go back and practice some more of those, you can do that. So this chart is also in that set of slides and this is the overall order of precedent. And so it talks about which things you're gonna do first and the parentheses, they always win. You start on the innermost and work your way out. If you've got any unary operators like negatives, plus pluses, minus minuses, or nots, they are all done next. And then we do all of the multiplication, division, and mod, then all the addition and subtraction, then all the greater than, less than, greater than or equal to, less than or equal to, then all the comparisons which are equal, equal, and not equal, and then we finally do the ands, the ors, and at the very, very bottom down there, we do the assignments. And there's multiple different ways to do assignments because you can do assignments with star equals and plus equals and whatnot, which I covered a moment ago. So that's the overall order, and you should definitely be familiar with that. We're going to give you questions on the test where you're going to have to know how to evaluate that. And then the final thing that's in this section is the random number generator. And this is used to pick a random number by the computer. So there are three lines that you need. Two of them you just need to do once in order to set it up. And that's another import statement, much like import Java Util Scanner. This one is Java Util Random. And then there's also the actual creation of the random object. And that's done with random my rand equals new random. Uh, again, my rand is just a variable name. You could call that anything you wanted. And then finally, once you've done both of those two setup statements, in order to pick a random number, you use my rand dot next int, um, which is what that should say on the screen there. There we go, sorry about that. So it's um, x equals my rand dot next int. And then in this case, there's a 100 in the parentheses. And the reason for that 100 is to tell it that I wanna pick a number between zero and 99. When you say next int 100, you get between zero and 99. If I were to say next int 42, it will pick a number between zero and 41. 
So that's how you pick a random number and it'll be stored in a variable, in this case, a variable called x. So that is the review. That is everything that is on this test. As I mentioned, about 20 questions. It's not going to be that hard. Make sure that you go back and you look at the actual PowerPoints and the videos for all of these sections. If you need to remember any part of this, I went very quickly in this review video just to get through it quickly, but there's a more detailed version of all of that in the earlier videos. So you may need to go back and rewatch those. And other than that, you guys are going to do great and uh, make me proud. Talk to you later.